one to SANS Network Security 2020. I hope you're having a wonderful time at the conference so far. My name is Jason Fawson. I am a SANS Institute Fellow. I've been writing and teaching courses for SANS since 1998, always with a Windows focus, and in the last 10 years, especially with a PowerShell focus. The main course that I do at SANS is course SEC 505, Securing Windows and PowerShell Automation. This presentation, plus my other presentations, plus hundreds of PowerShell scripts that I run, I just give away for free in the public domain. You can get it from blueteampowershell.com. There's no email registration required or anything like that. It's just a simple zip file. So if you would like this slide deck or the slide deck of, for example, my Process Hacker talk that I did last year at uh, this conference's um, keynote talk, then you can get that slide deck as well inside the zip file. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, then there's my Twitter handle, and I promise that this is always related to PowerShell, Windows security, malware, something like that. So what is this evening talk about? Well, in the first section, I'm going to discuss what is PowerShell. Many of you are attending courses here at the conference that include PowerShell labs, but because of time constraints, the instructors can't spend a lot of time discussing the background of PowerShell, how it works underneath the hood. Rather, you dive into the labs and then have fun. So this keynote talk gives an overview of what is PowerShell, especially if you're new to it, you've only heard of it, you've got labs that are coming up. So we're going to talk about what is PowerShell, especially under the hood. After this, we're going to discuss PowerShell security. In the last couple of years, there's been a rash of PowerShell malware. And for several years, there's been PowerShell hacking tools. So we'll talk about PowerShell security. And then in the third section, we're going to discuss the future of PowerShell. Like for example, PowerShell on Linux. All right, so what is PowerShell anyway? Well, PowerShell is not a command shell. PowerShell is more like an execution engine. And that engine is implemented by a set of DLLs. Now to call it an execution engine means that these DLLs can be hosted in other processes besides command shell processes. For example, you could have a graphical application or a web application, even a network service. So if we had to just give a single thing and call it PowerShell, it would likely be this DLL. But of course, there's many components that make up PowerShell. This is just one of the most important DLLs. Again, the main thing, PowerShell is not a command shell. It's an execution engine. And yes, it can be wrapped and interacted with through a command shell, but there are other ways to interact with that execution engine. Now, very importantly, this DLL and the other DLLs that make up PowerShell, they run on top of .NET. So that means you have to have .NET installed on the machine before you can install and run PowerShell. There are two major flavors or additions of .NET. So there's the full .NET framework that came out like in 2002 versus the newer kit on the block, .NET Core, that came out in 2016. Now I know that technically it's not called .NET Core anywhere. The word core has been dropped from the description. Now it's just called .NET, but I'm still gonna call it .NET Core to avoid confusion. If you just talk about .NET, well, that can be ambiguous. Are you referring to the original full .NET framework on Windows or the newer .NET Core or both or something else in between? So I know that Core has been dropped from the name, but I'm still gonna call it Core. Again, the full .NET framework came out many years ago, 2002. This is what's installed by default. This is what Windows PowerShell runs on top of. Now, .NET Core, that came out about 2016. And the most important thing about it is that .NET Core is cross-platform compatible. You can install that on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. And corresponding to these two different flavors or editions of .NET, we have two different editions or flavors of PowerShell. So we have the original Windows PowerShell that came out around 2006 that runs on top of the full .NET framework for Windows. But there's also PowerShell Core. Now that came out 
about 2018. Again, I know that the word core has been dropped from the name of, well, PowerShell core, but if we just use the word PowerShell, it's ambiguous. Are we talking about the original Windows PowerShell, the newer PowerShell core, or both? So I'm going to stick with uh, using the word core. Because PowerShell, whether it's Windows PowerShell or PowerShell core, is more of an execution engine, and it's a set of DLLs mainly, DLLs can't be run in the raw, so to speak. They can't be run directly. There has to be a host process for those DLLs. So the host process needs .NET plus the execution engine for PowerShell. So the hosting process, that could be a command shell, graphical application, web application, network service. This is important from a security perspective because for example, if you're trying to restrict the execution of PowerShell on a machine, if you just focus on the common host processes, but you ignore the DLLs, well, those DLLs then, they might be loaded into other host processes on the computer. So what are the most common host processes that you'll interact with? PowerShell.exe is for Windows PowerShell. When you run that on your computer, you'll get what appears to be a traditional text-oriented command shell, very similar to the old CMD shell. Now, PowerShell underscore ISE, PowerShell ISE, that's also for Windows PowerShell. And when you run that on your Windows box, you'll get an integrated scripting environment, a more graphically oriented application. That means you have a menu, icons in the toolbar, you can have multiple tabs open for multiple PowerShell sessions and multiple tabs open to edit multiple scripts at the same time. So those two first host processes, PowerShell.exe and PowerShell ISE, that's for Windows PowerShell. That's installed on Windows 7 and later by default. At the bottom, you have PWSH. That's for PowerShell Core. On Linux and Mac OS, it's just PWSH, and on Windows, it's PWSH.exe. So you might look at this and say, well, so what? Why should we care about this? What's so different about PowerShell? Yes, it's an execution engine, we hear you, but so is Java. Well, the big difference between PowerShell and almost every other, I almost said command shell or execution engine, I'll just say command shell. The big difference between PowerShell and almost every other command shell in the history of the world is that when you execute commands in PowerShell, the output of the command is a stream of objects, objects with properties and methods. Almost never are you manipulating raw text. Most other command shells, most other scripting languages are text oriented. So you have bash on Linux. You run a command like ifconfig, it outputs text. You might pipe that into grep. Again, you are piping text and manipulating text. But in PowerShell, on the other hand, when you are executing commands, virtually always the output of the command is one or more objects, objects with properties and methods. And almost always, these are .NET objects. Sometimes the objects are COM objects, C-O-M for component object model. These are the same types of objects that you had in VBScript and JavaScript, and PowerShell can manipulate COM objects as well. So for example, in PowerShell, if you run get process, that'll output objects representing all the processes running on the machine. If you have PowerShell on the machine in front of you right now, feel free, run get process, you can see the output. If you don't have PowerShell on the machine in front of you, that's fine. Here's a screenshot. This is for Windows PowerShell ISE. When I run get process, it outputs objects representing the processes running on the box. But when you look at it, you would swear that the output is text. After all, the pixels on your screen can be read and interpreted as text, but it's an illusion. Get process is outputting objects defined by the .NET framework. The objects represent processes. Those objects have many, many properties. Like for example, we can see some of the properties in the output here, like handles, working set, process ID number, 
and process name. But there's many more properties on top of that. It's just that PowerShell does not display them by default. If you execute a PowerShell command like this, get process. If you don't pipe it somewhere yourself, it's going to be piped secretly into another command that called out default. And then out default decides what to do with those objects. In this case, I'm running PowerShell inside the ISE editor. So it selects, PowerShell selects, not us, PowerShell selects some of the properties to be displayed. PowerShell decides how to display those properties on the screen, like in a table or a list. And as you can see in this case, PowerShell has selected about a half dozen properties and it's displaying those properties as a table. So you might think it's text, but it's an illusion. To make PowerShell behave and feel like, well, a traditional command shell, then it selects some of the properties for you, displays it as text. Now, this can lead to a very common mistake on PowerShell, namely to assume that this is outputting text. So you might run get process and then pipe the output into fine string or grep or sed awk, those kind of text oriented tools, but then it doesn't quite work right. It doesn't work the way that you expect, but that's because it was never text to begin with. It's more like an illusion. So if these commands are outputting objects with properties and methods, how can we learn about these objects, properties, and methods? Well, in PowerShell, there are thousands of built-in commands. It's really not possible to memorize them all. But there's one command that to memorize, it's get help. One of the best things about PowerShell is the wonderful built-in documentation. That's something that PowerShell definitely got right, right from the very beginning. It has great built-in documentation. So if I wanted to get help on the get process commandlet, I can run get help dash full and then the name of the commandlet that I want help for. For example, you'll now see what appears to be text on the screen. And in this case, it actually is reading from text and it's displaying it as text. Well, it, it appears to be text. It's actually string objects. But in the get help dash full output, you get a description of the command, a list of all of its parameters, and best of all, near the output at the bottom, you'll see examples of using the command. For example, for get process, there's about nine examples, and it shows how you can pipe those objects into other commands. It discusses the output, how to interact with the properties and so on. So if you're first getting, if you're now getting started with PowerShell or you're thinking about it, there are thousands of built-in commands, you can't memorize them all, but the only one really you have to memorize is get help. And from there, you can get help on everything else. But remember, the output of these commands is a stream of objects with properties and methods, usually not a stream of text and not bytes. So here's another command to memorize. You can run get process or any other PowerShell commandlet and pipe it into get member. Piping into get member is something that you'll do constantly in PowerShell. Because notice, when I run get process and I pipe it into get member, we're not piping text. We're piping objects. And what get member shows, first of all, is the type name or class name for the objects being piped into it. So what type or class of objects does get process produce? What is being piped into get member? It's system.diagnostics.process. Think of this as like the full Latin biological species name of that type of object. So if you were to ask your neighbor who is a biologist, what kind of dog do you have? Instead of your neighbor saying something like golden retriever or a cocker spaniel, your neighbor might give you the full Latin biological name, you know, kingdom, order, genus, species, and so on. Well, that's kind of like what this type name or class name is. And the handy thing about it, once you know the type name or class name, you can do an internet search on that name, and almost always the first link that you get will take you to Microsoft's website describing that class in the .NET framework. It'll describe the class, the properties and methods, and very often it shows sample code. The sample code is often in C-sharp, but because PowerShell is kind of like simplified C-sharp, well, the C-sharp examples are often very useful for PowerShell too.
But you know, if you just do that exact same search where you search on the class name, but then include the word PowerShell, then the odds are great that you're going to find some blog or forum or other resource on the internet where someone using PowerShell is manipulating or interacting with that class. But notice, going back to the screenshot again, you don't have to do an internet search because after the type name, GetMember will list the names of all the properties and methods of that class of object. Again, when you run get process, it's PowerShell that decides which of the properties to display to you and the formatting of that display, like a half dozen properties in a table. But there's many more properties available. You can't actually see these objects with your eyes. Someday in the future, you'll have a fiber optic cable that'll go directly from the computer into your brain. And then you can kind of directly grok or imagine with like internal virtual reality. And then you can directly apprehend, right, the, the form of the process, like in Plato's cave. But we're not quite there yet, right? So how can we better visualize and see these objects that we can't actually see with our eyes? Well, the second command I recommend you memorize is piping into GetMember, because now you can do a search on the name of the class, and you can see the names of the properties and methods. But what about seeing the data inside those properties? So there's one set of analogies for understanding PowerShell, and they're mostly wrong. They're all text-oriented analogies. You might say, well, PowerShell is the Windows command shell. I assume it's text-oriented, so I'll run some commands, and I'll pipe it into fine string or grep or other text-oriented tools, and almost always, that leads to frustration. I've taught PowerShell to thousands of people for the PowerShell course at SANS, and this is the number one obstacle or roadblock. It's the implicit assumption that PowerShell is like other command shells, where you're executing commands that output text, and so you are searching text and slicing and dicing text and redirecting or piping text, but you're not. So I recommend kind of setting aside all those analogies that lead down blind alleys where you think in terms of like text-oriented tools and text manipulation. Now instead, hopefully you have experience as a database administrator, a DBA, or you have experience with SQL, structured query language, or at least you have experience with spreadsheets, like Excel spreadsheets. Because databases and SQL and spreadsheets, these actually provide a much better set of analogies for understanding PowerShell. For example, there's several PowerShell commandlets that are modeled on SQL. There's commandlets like select object, where object, sort object. So for example, when I run get process, I can pipe the objects it produces like I'm piping records from a table and a database. And instead of talking about the properties of those objects, we can talk about the fields of those records. Now, this is a much more productive set of analogies for understanding PowerShell. So how do we do something like a select query where I can get those records and fields? In the screen here, I run get process, I pipe it into select object dash property star. Now by analogy, that's very similar to doing select star from get process. So we can kind of treat get process as a table, but of course it's not a table, it's a command that's outputting objects or outputting records, and then we're piping those records. So here's what it looks like on your screen. In this case, I'm not gonna get all processes, Instead, I create one object that represents the LSAS process. And I pipe that one object into select property star. Now select property star tells PowerShell, I want to see all of the properties on the left-hand side. Those are the names of the properties. And I want to see all the data inside those properties on the right-hand side. So you can see on the left-hand side, you have properties, or how about let's call them fields. You have fields like name, process ID number, working set size, VM for virtual memory. And on the right-hand side is the data inside of those fields. But again, in PowerShell, we call them properties. So if you have some experience 
manipulating databases or SQL or just even Excel spreadsheets. That's a better set of analogies for understanding what's really going on under the hood with PowerShell. And you can avoid frustration then by kind of giving up those old 20th century text-oriented habits and instead thinking more like a DBA where your objects are like records in a table and the properties of those records are like fields. So again, here's the short list. There are thousands of commands built into PowerShell. You can't memorize them all. So where do you get started? So here's perhaps a, the shortest cheat sheet ever, right, for getting started with PowerShell. First, I recommend get help dash full. You can find all your commands and excellent built-in documentation. And then after that, you can run any commandlet, pipe the output through get member, that'll give you the class name or type name, plus the names of all the properties and methods of the objects. And that really drives home the whole idea that we are not piping text, we're piping objects from the .NET framework. And then for the analogies with SQL, you can run a command, pipe it through select object star. And that's very similar to in an SQL query, select star from a table. But in this case, we're kind of like piping that table into select instead of reading it passively. Okay. So for getting started with PowerShell, these are the three commandlets. And the number one most important piece of advice I can give, you are producing objects with properties and methods, not text. And remember, there's two major flavors or additions of PowerShell. There's Windows PowerShell that's been installed ever since Windows 7 that runs on top of the full .NET framework. But there's the newer PowerShell core that runs on top of .NET Core, but again, I, I know that the word core has been dropped officially, but that's the newer kit on the block. That's the cross-platform and open source version of PowerShell. Now, all that being stated, in the next section, we're going to discuss PowerShell security or insecurity. In the last several years, there's been a rash of PowerShell malware and a whole plethora of PowerShell hacking tools. So why do hackers love PowerShell so much? Oh, old habits are hard to forget. Why do threat actors love PowerShell so much, right? So why did we switch from hackers to threat actors? Because it's scarier. That's how you get more money from the superiors above you in your organization, right? Hackers now refers to like, you know, cute, you know, uh, you know, well-intentioned teenagers, like from that old hackers movie, you know, with, oh gosh, it's so horrible, right? It just makes you cringe, but it's so bad, it's good, right? It's like, you know, hackers with Angelina uh, Jolie and, you know, that blonde guy, whatever. So hackers, that's not scary enough anymore. Why do threat actors love PowerShell so much? It's because why wouldn't they? If you're living off the land and you break into a Windows 7 or later machine, PowerShell provides a built-in and coder-friendly wrapper for the entire operating system. Picture PowerShell as something like a friendly octopus, where all the tentacles of the octopus reach deeply into the operating system, the services, drivers, protocol stack, processes, everything, all those tentacles deeply embedded in. But it's not a malicious octopus, it's friendly. Again, the documentation is great. You have lots of online support. The PowerShell community is, is very large and positive and, and encouraging and friendly. So if you were to hack into a machine, why wouldn't you use PowerShell? Through PowerShell, you have access to more or less the entire operating system and .NET. So through PowerShell, we have access to the .NET class library. You have access to COM objects like in VBScript and JavaScript. PowerShell is also deeply integrated. Its tentacles are deeply integrated into the WMI service. WMI, hackers love that as well. WMI is great. You can use it for remote command execution, persistence, searching event logs, tons of things. In fact, many PowerShell commandlets are like thin wrappers on top of the features, like things like namespaces, classes, and instances that you get access to through the WMI service. So many PowerShell commandlets, especially the networking commandlets, 
are kind of like thin wrappers for WMI. And that's another way of saying that PowerShell and WMI are deeply integrated together. But it goes beyond that. Imagine that you have a PowerShell script that's 2,000 lines long, but 1,700 of those lines are C sharp. And when you run your PowerShell script, it compiles that C sharp code into a module in memory. Now the rest of your PowerShell script can now access and use that module to, for example, access functions provided by the Windows API. The Windows API is a low level programming interface to the kernel of the operating system. So things that you might assume you could only do with a compiled binary program, maybe written in C++, instead you could access with an uncompiled PowerShell script. Because that PowerShell script has C sharp code, on the fly it's compiled in memory, and then using that module, you can access much of the rest of the operating system. And of course, on the hard drive, you still have traditional binary tools. So we have IP config, IF config, and all the other hundreds of binary tools that PowerShell can run. PowerShell can also access other machines over the network. Again, this is another reason that threat actors love PowerShell. There's PowerShell commandlets for remoting. Using the web services for management protocol, you can PowerShell remote into other machines to upload and download files, remotely execute commands, remotely execute whole scripts. For example, if you have server 2012 or later machines, those machines by default are listening on port 5985, waiting for inbound PowerShell remoting connections. And if you can authenticate as someone who's a member of the administrators group, well then, now you can start uploading and downloading files, remotely executing scripts, and in other words, move laterally from machine to machine inside the LAN. You have to have the necessary credentials first, but once you have the credentials of an account that's in the administrators group on all your machines, well then one of the ways that you can move laterally is just to use built-in PowerShell remoting. Now for client operating systems like Windows 7 and Windows 10, PowerShell remoting is not enabled by default, but it's easily enabled, like through a PowerShell command or group policy. There are several PowerShell commandlets that can use RPC connections, or can go through the WMI service to establish an RPC connection to other machines. And of course, you can use SMB, like for uploading and downloading files and using RPC on top of SMB. There's also a PowerShell equivalent of curl or wget, it's called invoke web request. Now you can access web services, or if you're running malware, your malware can phone home. It might establish an outbound HTTPS connection, download a command file, and then it'll start executing the commands from that file. With PowerShell Core, by the way, PowerShell Core was designed for interaction, I'm sorry, integration with SSH. So you can set up open SSH servers, connect with tools like PuTTY or the SSH client from Linux, but you could also use PowerShell core and commands like invoke command. And in this case, when you execute commands over SSH on other machines, you get back objects, not just raw text. And speaking of raw, you can also use PowerShell to listen on TCP and UDP ports, just like a service, or you can access the TCP and UDP ports on other machines. For example, you could implement something like, how about Metasploit? Could Metasploit be rewritten top to bottom in PowerShell? Yes. So again, why wouldn't hackers use PowerShell after taking over the machine? especially if you need to live off the land. So in the last few years, there's been lots of talk about PowerShell attacks. Think of, you know, the attack matrix from MITRE. But let's think about that a little bit more. As you examine the attack matrix, as you read about these so-called PowerShell attacks, what you find is that PowerShell is almost never used for the initial compromise of the target box or the target land. Instead, almost always, PowerShell is used for post-exploitation, 
So your adversaries, they might send you hundreds of thousands of phishing emails to the employees in your organization. Some of the employees click on the links or the attachments. Now, because of flaw in the browser or the PDF viewer or some other component of the operating system, the malware seizes control of the box, connects back out to the internet, perhaps with the browser or its libraries itself, and then downloads a PowerShell script. Now, is this really a PowerShell attack? Couldn't that exact same code download a binary or JavaScript or VB script, or how about just an old fashioned batch script? So in this case, I would describe that attack as, well, a browser attack or a phishing attack. The vulnerability that allowed our adversaries to take over the machine was a flaw, like in the browser or the PDF viewer or some other application on the box. But yes, your adversaries are executing PowerShell code, but not for the initial compromise, not for the initial break-in, but almost always for post-exploitation. And again, why wouldn't they? PowerShell is great, so if it's already installed in the machine and you can use it for lateral movement and exfiltration and everything else that you want, why wouldn't you use it? So now we come to your CISO's question. You may have heard this. How do I secure PowerShell or how do we in the organization secure PowerShell? I've heard this myself as a consultant. Now, implicit in the question always is kind of the implicit assumption, how do I secure PowerShell separately from the operating system? As though PowerShell kind of floats disconnected, like a ping pong ball floating on a, you know, on a stream of air above the operating system. That is not how PowerShell works. PowerShell does not float disconnected above the operating system. It's the opposite. It's more like a hundred tentacle friendly octopus with all of his tentacles deeply integrated into the operating system, the file system, the registry, everything. So when your CISO asks, how can we secure PowerShell separately from the operating system? Well, the answer is separately, you can't. PowerShell and the operating system are merged together almost as one. Now, yes, I know that technically under the hood, PowerShell is running as a user mode process. It's using .NET and all the protections that NotVet provides. But from a management perspective, again, the question is why do hackers love it so much? It's precisely because all of its tentacles are deeply integrated into the operating system. So how do we secure PowerShell? Well, you can't secure it separately. Instead, focus on host and network hardening. We want to prevent that initial compromise through the browser or the email application. And we want to thwart lateral movement as much as possible. Because again, let's just imagine that PowerShell tomorrow just suddenly disappeared. Well, there's still VBScript and JavaScript and bash scripts and binary tools. So if your adversaries are compromising your machine, like through phishing attacks or watering hole attacks, it's not like they're going to give up, right? Because PowerShell goes away. They're still going to be running attack tools. It's just that they won't be PowerShell tools. They'll be written in some other language. After this, upgrade to the latest operating system you can and quickly apply patches. We want to remove as many exploitable vulnerabilities as possible whether it's in PowerShell, the operating system, or anything else. And of course, we want to get users out of the administrators groups on their machines. For example, let's imagine that PowerShell were perfect. It has zero flaws, no vulnerabilities whatsoever. But the user is a member of the administrators group. And the user is tricked like through social engineering into clicking on a hyperlink or an email attachment. Now the malware executes PowerShell scripts as the user, but the user is a member of the administrators group. Well, the machine is totally compromised. Again, there could be zero flaws in the design of PowerShell, zero vulnerabilities. And let's take it a step further. You could have zero vulnerabilities whatsoever in the Windows operating system, but if that PowerShell script is running with administrative privileges, the machine is still compromised. Now, if that one box is compromised, what about the other machines? 
So again, we want to use multi-factor authentication whenever possible because now that the machine has been compromised and your adversaries are trying to move laterally, hopefully they're trying to attack a service that requires multi-factor authentication and the malware does not have access to your multi-factor authentication token, like maybe a smart card, a, a YubiKey or something else. For the lateral movement, we also need host-based firewalls for defense and depth. We should assume that our adversaries are already inside of our networks and they're leapfrogging from machine to machine inside the LAN. Firewalls are not just for the perimeter, not just for laptops. Every machine inside the LAN should have a firewalling capability. It doesn't mean that you're dropping all packets by default, but you need at least a firewalling capability. You might allow all packets to and from your workstations inside the LAN, and then you'll have firewall rules to drop or block what you know that you don't need. For example, with PowerShell remoting, perhaps you'll only allow PowerShell remoting from the jump servers and the workstations of the administrators. But otherwise, regular users are not permitted to even talk to the PowerShell remoting ports. Just like in a Linux environment, who should be able to SSH into those critical database servers? Do you really want to expose port 22 to the entire internal network or the entire internet? Well, if we wouldn't do that for SSH, we wouldn't do that for the PowerShell remoting port either. And what about zero trust? The cloud vendors talk about zero trust always in terms of, well, accessing cloud services. Now, zero trust, we would have just called common sense years ago, but now it's become a marketing term for the cloud vendors. Inside your LAN, you could do zero trust with IPsec. Now, this is not IPsec for a VPN. This is just using the native IPsec driver built into the protocol stack. And now you could do role-based access control. You could require authentication to access some of the listening ports and services on your workstations and servers, limit access to those ports based on their group memberships in Active Directory. So we can now do role-based access control at the port level. So for defense and depth then, we want host-based firewalls and IPsec. And you know, that's really true whether your adversaries are using PowerShell, VBScript, binary tools, that's true in any case. So again, when the CISO asks, how can I secure PowerShell the implication is secure PowerShell separately from the operating system, separately from our users and their security training and the fact that they're in the administrators group. So how can you secure PowerShell separately from these things? You can't. PowerShell is deeply integrated into the OS. Now, what about something that's more unique or internal to PowerShell? AMSI stands for Anti-Malware Scan Interface. With AMSI, as PowerShell code runs in memory, your antivirus scanner or endpoint security product can examine the PowerShell code right before it executes. And if that PowerShell code is obfuscated, compressed, encrypted, or whatever techniques your adversaries are attempting to use to hide the PowerShell code from the endpoint security products like AV scanners, as each layer of compression or obfuscation is stripped away, going through the AMSI interface, your antivirus scanner can examine each layer as it's being stripped away. Because eventually, that malware has to expose and execute normal PowerShell commands. And hopefully that's when your AV scanner will detect it and block it. So whoever your favorite antivirus vendor is, ask the vendor, do you support AMSI? If the vendor doesn't support it, dump them and get somebody better. And then the next question is, this product, this AV product, it supports AMSI. Is it enabled by default? How do I turn it on on my machines? Now, we all know that antivirus is not perfect, not by a long shot. But we're trying to raise the bar centimeter by centimeter that our adversaries have to jump over to compromise the machine or to move laterally inside the LAN. That's what we're aiming for here by using endpoint security products like AV scanners that support AMSI. You can also use application control technologies. Think of like Carbon Black or AppLocker. Application control technologies that can restrict the scripts that are being executed, 
the PowerShell DLLs and the PowerShell host binaries. Again, a common mistake is to use an application control product to control PowerShell.exe, PowerShell ISC, PWSH, Visual Studio Code, let's say. That's a mistake because remember, PowerShell is an execution engine. It's a set of DLLs. You're better off actually focusing on restricting the DLLs and then secondarily also restrict the common host processes like PowerShell.exe. Now, very similar to this concept of application control is the language mode of PowerShell. So internal to PowerShell itself now, PowerShell implements internally policies about what bells and whistles of PowerShell can be used. So the default language mode is full language mode. In full language mode, all the bells and whistles of PowerShell are available to you and also available to your adversaries. Now, the opposite of that is so-called no language mode. Like if you're using a just enough admin sandbox, the GIA endpoint, with a GIA endpoint, all commands are blocked by default and you can put the language mode into no language mode. Now in no language mode, almost all the bells and whistles of PowerShell are turned off. For example, you can't even use flow control keywords like while, switch, and for each. What's in the middle though? In the middle between full language mode and no language mode is constrained language mode. Now Microsoft's goal here is to leave enabled the bells and whistles of PowerShell that are very commonly used while disabling the bells and whistles that are typically only used by hackers and advanced developers. Now, Microsoft on the whole has done a good job. It's never going to be perfect. There's always gonna be some scripts, right? That you wish would run correctly in constrained language mode. It's just that you have a few lines in that script that are using advanced techniques, which are blocked by the language mode. But the benefit of using constrained language mode is huge. The majority of PowerShell hacking tools simply do not run at all or do not run fully in constrained language mode. Now, how do you enable this? Well, you could use something like AppLocker or you could set an environment variable to turn it on. On the internet, just research PowerShell constrained language mode on Microsoft's website. And of course, I, I talk about it in my PowerShell course too. But this is a quick win. You'll have to do some testing to confirm that it doesn't break any of your legitimate strings. But the good news is, your odds are fairly good. Fairly good that your PowerShell logon scripts and scheduled tasks will run just fine, even in constrained language mode. And remember that if you're managing this like through group policy or other enterprise management product, different machines can have different language modes configured. Now, after the last few slides, you might say, well, why not just block PowerShell completely then? Why not just take the next logical step and just block PowerShell? Now, by analogy, what if somebody said, think of NotPetya, WannaCry, Eternal Blue. We should get rid of port 139, 445, disable and stop the server service, also known as the file printer sharing service, and just get rid of that entirely. Now, yes, that would help with the eternal blue exploit and you know, the wanna cry worm and similar attacks against that service and the SMB protocol, but think of what you're missing. You are now losing out on mapping drive letters, downloading logon scripts, downloading group policy objects. All this requires the SMB protocol. So if you were to get rid of SMB and the file and print sharing service entirely, well, yes, strictly speaking, you are getting rid of current and future vulnerabilities that could be exploited, but the cost is just way too high. Remember, if you get rid of PowerShell completely, yes, your adversaries can't use it, but neither can you. And now you can't use it like for hardening, threat hunting, auditing. So you might say, your system might say, all right, I agree. We can't, you know, chop off our arms and legs just because our arms and legs sometimes are frail or have vulnerabilities. We need those arms and legs. So 
what if we strike like a, a balance? What if we try to run PowerShell in some kind of sealed sandbox? And again, it, it's that image of PowerShell like floating like a ping pong ball on top of a cushion of air above the operating system. Besides, you can hear your CISO say, isn't the future things like Docker containers, Microsoft sandbox, wrapping potentially malicious code inside of special protected enclaves and memory? Isn't that the industry trend? Oh, but remember, what's the purpose of PowerShell? What if you could run PowerShell in some kind of sealed sandbox in memory where it couldn't touch the file system or the registry or the network or services or applications or anything? I mean, what would it be good for? I guess you could have like a, a PowerShell version of, of Tetris or maybe some text-oriented adventure game like from the 1980s. But even then, right, you're still typing in on your keyboard and sending it into that sealed sandbox and it's displaying out on your graphical interface in some sense. So the problem is, if you could run PowerShell in some kind of sealed sandbox, like that floating ping pong ball floating above the operating system, suddenly now PowerShell is useless. Ironically, if you were to get rid of PowerShell completely, your adversaries would just follow the next path of least resistance. They would just take the next soft target. They're still living off the land. Your adversaries are still doing phishing attacks and sprinkling flash drives in your parking lot. Ironically, you want your adversaries to use PowerShell because PowerShell logging is great. Again, this is one of the best things about PowerShell, the built-in help, the transcription logging, all the different forms or flavors of logging that PowerShell provides, that's actually great. Microsoft has done a really good job here for the logging. Now, as your adversaries are using PowerShell, like to move laterally from machine to machine or for post-exploitation, you can log their commands, the command line arguments, and even the output of those commands. We can now feed that log data over the network into a SIM. So, just like you asked your AV vendor about AMSI, contact your favorite SIM vendor and ask, does your product ingest PowerShell log data? Now, almost all of them are gonna say yes. Now, once you get them to answer yes to that question, can you ingest PowerShell log data? Now, here's the follow-up question. And can your SIM analyze in real time or at least near real time, that log data as it's flowing in, looking for patterns that indicate potential indicators of compromise or signs of actual compromise and lateral movement and all the other patterns that we care about. Now, this is where you have to pin them to the wall. We're paying those SIM vendors for these products. We're supposed to be getting like real time alerts or at least near real time, let's say within 15 minutes when there's indicators of compromise while PowerShell is being abused. But this is where the SIM vendors are really kind of dropping the ball. And I'm not gonna name any names, uh, I've gotten in trouble for that. I know that in the last couple of years, there's been like a, a cottage industry of, you know, let's say like a, a forensics tool that can manually extract PowerShell logs from one machine and then examine those logs looking for these patterns. And don't get me wrong, those tools are great, like for instant response and forensics, but does that scale? It doesn't. What we need is for the SIM vendors to do that same type of pattern analysis, either with regular expressions or artificial neural nets or whatever that vendor wants to implement, but that SIM vendor is the one that should be analyzing that log data streaming in from hundreds or perhaps even thousands of machines looking for those indicators of compromise. So ask your antivirus vendor, do you support AMSI? And then ask your SIM vendor, can you ingest and analyze PowerShell logs looking for potential indicators of compromise? So doing incident response and forensics, that's, that's extremely useful, but that's after the fact. What we need is ideally real-time analysis, and that's where the SIM vendor should be stepping up to the plate. All right, so that's an overview then of what to do about PowerShell security, but really talking about PowerShell security separate from the users, their administrative group memberships, and the underlying operating system, 
talking about these things as though they're separate is a mistake. Now, so far, I've talked about lots of good things about PowerShell. Let's talk about the future now. It's not that there's bad things about the future. It's just that there's big question marks. So Windows PowerShell came out about 2006. It's been around for a long time. PowerShell Core had general availability in 2018. This is the new kid on the block. But why PowerShell Core? Well, it's the new Microsoft. Microsoft doesn't really sell shrink-wrapped licenses anymore. Instead, Microsoft is a cloud provider and all of their activities is designed to get you into the cloud, keep you in the cloud, and to milk you month after month after month forever for all the services and data that Microsoft provides in the cloud. So all roads now lead to Azure, Microsoft 365, SharePoint Online and Exchange Online and Intune and all those other cloud services like Azure Active Directory. All roads lead now to Microsoft's cloud. That's the entire business model. Microsoft doesn't talk about it much, but over half of the virtual machines or containers in Azure don't run Windows Server. They run Linux. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised at all if today it's over 75%. And frankly, I would only be shocked for like a, a second or two if it were something like 80 or 90% of the virtual machines in Azure were running Linux. I wouldn't be surprised really that much. Microsoft also missed out on the whole mobile device pot of gold. Windows Phone was crushed by Android and iPhone. Well, the next gigantic pot of gold that all the big cloud providers are going after is the Internet of Things pot. So very soon, we will have many hundreds of billions and eventually trillions of devices that all have wireless connectivity up to the cloud. Eventually, your cat will have a chip either embedded inside or in its collar, and you'll be able to get the GPS coordinates and the temperature, right, and the heartbeat of your cat, right, through the cloud. So this is the next gigantic pot of gold that Microsoft wants to go after and not miss out, like they missed out on mobile. But most IoT devices today run Linux. And the ones that don't run Linux, most of them run a specialized, like, real-time operating system. And in any case, they don't run Windows. Here's something else. A large percentage of developers prefer Mac OS over Windows for doing their development work. We need, Microsoft needs a version of PowerShell then that can run on Mac OS, Linux, and Windows. It needs to be cross-platform compatible because if PowerShell is Windows only, then these other ships are sailing away. IAAS, right? Infrastructure as a Service, Virtual Machines, IoT devices, and the developer's own personal computers. What is Microsoft's biggest competitor here? Very often PowerShell is compared to something like Bash on Linux, or maybe Z Shell or Fish. And that's fine, there's characteristics that are in common between PowerShell and those other command shells. But again, PowerShell is not really, not truly a command shell. It's more of an execution engine with its own scripting language. The 10,000 kilogram gorilla in the room is Python. Python is the main competitor for PowerShell. So if you've never seen the Red Monk scores, horizontally across the x-axis at the bottom, we have popularity rank on GitHub. This is basically just a crude count of projects and the language that's used for that project. And on the vertical or y-axis on the left-hand side, we have popularity rank on Stack Overflow, again by the tags for the uh, operating for the scripting or programming languages that are used. So in the upper right-hand corner, you find in general, just roughly speaking, I don't put too much weighting on the exact ordering here, but in the upper right-hand corner in general, you tend to find the most popular, vibrant, or up-and-coming languages. So there's PowerShell way up there in the upper right-hand corner. 
again, I've been teaching uh, the PowerShell course for SANS for over 10 years now. And every year, PowerShell gets more and more popular. And it's just been creeping up this, uh, this diagram. But notice what's at the far right, upper right-hand side. It's Python. For years, I've been worried about this because, again, mainly I do, you know, PowerShell, uh, you know, training and consulting. So I've been doing Amazon advanced book searches at least since 2015. So if I do a search for printed books, printed after November of 2006, because that's when PowerShell first came out, and you have to keep the subject category computers and technology. Otherwise, you'll get things like Monty Python and Python snakes, that sort of thing. And I've just been doing a kind of a, a rough count of how many books Amazon has available on these products. So back in 2015, there were 484 Python books and 119 PowerShell books. But now I did that same search again just a few days ago. There's over 2,000 books on Python. And why is it only 2,000? Well, that's the limit of what the search will show. Doing some other searches, I think it's more like in the ballpark of like five or 7,000. And how about for PowerShell? It's, it's only 471. So where's PowerShell for kids? PowerShell for machine learning? PowerShell for big data analytics? So as a competitor then, is Python coder friendly? Yes. Cross-platform? Yes. Object-oriented? Yes, mostly. How about built-in? So May of last year, here's an article on Microsoft's website. It kind of tongue-in-cheek said, who put Python in the Windows 10 May update? Well, Python is actually not installed, but what is installed is a so-called app execution alias. You can actually see this if you go to the All Settings app and then do a search for app execution alias or just alias. And you can see that there's python.exe and python3.exe. So that on Windows with the appropriate uh, update applied, if you were to go to a command shell and then run Python, a graphical app pops up prompting you to install Python from the Windows store, the Microsoft store. They made it as easy as possible. Microsoft and the Python team, they worked together to make it as easy as possible to install Python. Now, that's pretty darn close to getting Python installed by default. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if next year, if Windows 10 Enterprise had Python installed by default. I don't think it's going to happen, but I wouldn't be totally shocked. And by the way, when hackers take over those machines, they will happily use Python, right? So are we now going to start talking about Python attacks? Well, not really. It's going to be Python post-exploitation if that were to happen. Microsoft also wants to appeal to developers with Windows subsystem for Linux. So developers might use Mac OS or Linux because they're developing code that runs on Linux servers. But with the Windows subsystem for Linux, you get a real Linux kernel running on top of Windows. It runs in something like, think of it as a, uh, like a deeply, tightly integrated virtual machine or Docker container. I know it's not exactly that, it's just an analogy. But think of it as like a deeply integrated container or VM integrated into the underlying operating system, almost like an octopus might have tentacles into the underlying operating system. You see the whole point? Because if the Windows subsystem for Linux ran as kind of like a disconnected, hermetically sealed bubble, it would be useless. But it is tightly integrated into the underlying operating system. In fact, I don't know if you saw the announcement, but Windows subsystem for Linux will soon be able to directly mount entire drives, maybe a drive formatted with ETX, maybe ZFS, or other Linux-oriented file systems. Now, of course, with the Windows subsystem for Linux, almost every distribution of Linux that you would install this way will come with Python. So Microsoft's approach is pretty optimistic when it comes to PowerShell Core. The idea is, it's very optimistic. If we build it, they will come. Linux and Mac developers will come to PowerShell if we build it. 
So this has been a major engineering effort at Microsoft to develop PowerShell Core, to make it cross-platform and open source and so on. If you can go to GitHub, github.com slash PowerShell, you can now download PowerShell Core for different operating systems in different package formats for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. On Ubuntu, for example, you can also install it as a snap package. It's very easy. Snap install PowerShell dash dash classic. So Microsoft has done a good job at making PowerShell Core easy to install in Linux. But remember the tentacles analogy again. How, for example, the Windows PowerShell commandlets for managing networking, most of those are like thin wrappers for the WMI service. But the WMI service does not exist on Linux. In Windows PowerShell, there's over 200 commandlets related to networking, many of them for Hyper-V and software-defined networking. Now, what about those networking-related commandlets for PowerShell Core running on Linux? Well, on the right-hand side, this is a screenshot from Twitter. Steve Lee is the main program manager at Microsoft for PowerShell. Somebody asked him, what about the networking commandlets for Linux? And the answer is there's currently no plan to port those to non-Windows operating systems. So that means you're using tools like ifconfig and IP, netstat, lsof, nmcli, and all the other traditional tools, right, for managing networking on Linux. Well, all right, that's fine. I mean, no command shell can have all batteries included for all platforms whatsoever. So maybe it's all right. But what about other ways of using PowerShell on Linux? For example, I really think Microsoft should invest in like, like $10,000 to hire a, a developer or two to create a PowerShell module for Samba. Because that's kind of like a natural migration pathway. You could have a Windows administrator on a Windows file server who's now in charge of a Samba file server running on Linux. So shared folders and permissions and user accounts, the whole bit. It's kind of like a natural migration pathway. So that could be a good story for Microsoft to tell. You say, here's a great module. Microsoft supports it. You can now use PowerShell command list designed for Samba. But it doesn't exist. Yes, there's some Samba scripts out there for PowerShell, but these are not officially supported and financially supported by Microsoft to make it a really robust a package, right, to act as a magnet to draw people to PowerShell and Linux. And of all the things on Linux that I think that is ideally suited for PowerShell, it's System D. System D is what makes Linux more like Windows. Uh, don't send me hate mail, right? Don't shoot the messenger. But what makes Linux more like Windows really is System D. So think of all the unit files and all the commands that you have for system D. Well, that would so easily map onto PowerShell commandlets. So you can have objects that represent the units and so on. And something else is kind of near and dear to my heart is ZFS. The ZFS tools like ZPool and, and ZFS, these are very well-written, well-behaved tools. So that when you run these tools, you can have PowerShell intercept the output and then convert that text into objects where all your ZF data, like your Z devs and your pools and whatnot, all that can be represented as, all that data can be represented as properties of PowerShell objects. In fact, I even started working on uh, some of those scripts myself. But I'm just one person. This needs Microsoft backing. If Microsoft is saying, if we build PowerShell core, then Linux people will come, there's gotta be a reason to come. So if it's not networking, and it's not Samba or System D or ZFS, so what is it? Now, here's something else. This is a screenshot of Bash, well, Terminal, but inside of Terminal, I'm running Bash on Ubuntu Linux. And the first line at the very top, if you're not familiar with the DD command, I'm getting six bytes, saving those bytes to a file, test.bin. Now, the exact bytes doesn't matter. That's why they're random. But there's now a file, test.bin. It contains exactly six bytes of data. Now, remember, at the very top of this screenshot, I'm still in bash on Ubuntu. So now we run cat 
and I'm using the full path to cat to make sure that there's no doubt about what version of cat I'm using. But I cat that file test.bin into hex dump, and that shows in hexadecimal the six bytes of data in the file. I now launch PowerShell, PWSH. I run the same Ubuntu cat. I pipe the output into hex dump and notice the output. That's not the same. That's not six bytes. It's not even the same six bytes like repeated multiple times. And even if it were repeated multiple times, or even if it were Unicode, or no matter what the explanation is, it's not the original six bytes. And notice that down below at the bottom, if I run hex dump from within PowerShell and I directly pass in that file, well then it correctly displays the six bytes. The culprit here is the pipe symbol. The pipe symbol in PowerShell is designed around the piping of objects, not piping text streams or byte streams. Now, for my consulting clients, for, for my students in my course, I have to talk about this. I mean, I, I would be professionally and morally remiss if I did not show this to Linux developers or Linux administrators and then say, watch out, this is a known issue. And by known issue, it's, it's been at least a couple years that this is known. So this is not like some kind of surprise to Microsoft. Microsoft knows about it, they're working about it, they care about it. Again, sometimes people say things like, oh, well, those Microsoft developers, you know, they're not very sharp or hardworking, they're bad programmers. That's not true. The PowerShell team, they care, they're sharp, they're hardworking, they know about the issue. But of course, they have to deal with budget constraints and all the internal politics at Microsoft. So down at the bottom right, you see some GitHub links. You can read about the issue. In the middle, this came directly from GitHub. Somebody writes, I don't know what the right solution is, but as of PowerShell Core 7, PowerShell and external or native executables are like separate worlds. So when you're executing PowerShell commands within PowerShell, you're producing objects and piping objects. But on Linux, when you run an external command, let's say like ifconfig or lsof, that's like a separate universe, a separate process. And if you do things like pipe the output of that external process into a PowerShell commandlet or into other tools, that pipe symbol in PowerShell, it might change the data on the fly in unexpected ways. In fact, even sometimes text is modified in unexpected ways. The problem is the new lines. So is it carriage return line feed? Is it just carriage return? Is it just line feed? Sometimes there's just extra new lines. So yes, if the extra new lines doesn't break anything, then, then that's fine, you can work your way around it. But sometimes it does break things. And what about sending or receiving raw byte streams? Like for example, if you know about ZFS, how you can do ZFS send and receive over an SSH connection. Now, what if you're running a PowerShell script with these ZFS and SSH tools, and because of the piping going on, what if it's corrupting the data on the fly? Uh, again, this would be a nightmare. So in the bottom left, uh, this was a, a tweet from just a few days ago uh, as I was making these slides. And here's someone complaining about these issues, talking about it, asking Microsoft about it. And he says, this is a real bummer, right? Talk about an understatement. This is a bummer. In fact, this is the sort of issue I'm reluctant to even be open about raising with my Unix admins on my team because I'm worried they'll seize on it as an opportunity to dunk on PowerShell as a whole. And I agree, that is a huge risk. Because again, when I go back to that prior slide, showing even something simple as catting a binary file into hex dump, and, it, and it's not outputting what you expect. I mean, this is, it's, it's unacceptable. So what about textual configuration files? So if we're not going through like system D, then a lot of Linux and Unix administration is reading textual configuration files out of the Etsy folder, modifying those config files, and then writing them back again. PowerShell has select string and other tools and classes in the .NET framework for text manipulation. But the thing is, they're not as good as sedgrep and awk. 
They're not as fast as like SegRep and Auk. They're not as reliable. So if you're using a PowerShell script, but really you're just using it to run like, you know, SED and grep and other tools for doing text manipulation to manage these Etsy configuration files. I mean, then again, where's that special PowerShell magic that will draw in Linux administrators to actually use PowerShell instead of bash, let's say. Now, a few years ago, Microsoft was busily working on something called desired state configuration. This potentially could be a reason why you would go to PowerShell core on Linux. You want to use DSC. So DSC competed with things like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, and Salt. Now the problem though, is that DSC kind of imploded under the weight of its own complexity and the lack of financial and other backing from Microsoft. So in my PowerShell course at SANS, I had a big module and multiple labs on DSC. In fact, I was gonna use DSC through all the days of the week. But then about a year and a half ago, Microsoft started making some announcements. They said, we're making some plan changes and some things are being delayed and we're not quite sure what to do about X, Y, and Z. And things kind of stalled out. And today, where's DSC? Does Microsoft talk about it much anymore? Not really. That's even a separate team from the PowerShell team. DSC now has become kind of like a marketing bullet point for Azure. And ironically, who's using DSC more out there in the world, I think are the competing technologies like, like Puppet, for example. In fact, Puppet just made an announcement, I, I think like literally like 12 or 24 hours ago about new deeper integration with Puppet and DSC resources. And great, uh, I, I hope it's successful. But what about on Linux again? So in Linux with PowerShell core, you have invoke DSC resource, but uh, that one little commandlet is experimental. Even after all this time, still experimental. So if you have a choice between something like Puppet Chef, Ansible and Salt, these are mature products, very popular, and something experimental, and it's just one little tool. And what about pull servers and push mode and partial configurations and well, all the other bells and whistles that we need in my opinion, DSC is probably dead. So it's still kicking around out there. But you know, if you've been following Microsoft for years, you've seen this story before. Think of Silverlight, ISA server, which then became Threat Management Gateway, or Network Access Protection, or Groove, or Zune, right? It's not as though Microsoft suddenly decides, well, we don't think this product has a future put out a press release, right? Zoom is dead. Uh, they just don't do that, really. Well, they did that for Windows Phone. So DSC is kind of struggling along, and I feel really bad because the people, the volunteers out there who put so much time and effort into DSC, what's going to happen to all that code, all those resource modules? So for example, the main website for this today is dscommunity.org. Notice that it's not dsc.microsoft.com is dsc community. In other words, Microsoft is kind of, well, punted in some ways. They say, hey, community out there, if you want it, then go ahead and run with it, but we're not going to invest a huge amount of money. Instead, we're gonna do like Azure guest policy configuration and, and we'll see what happens. Maybe that'll be a good marketing bullet point for Azure, maybe not. It seems like Microsoft is not really committed to it. It's like development is slow as a glacier. I have to admit, I, I kind of laughed when I, I saw this, uh, this article. The SharePoint DSC is one of the bigger, more popular uses of DSC out there. In fact, it might even be the most popular use of DSC out there in the world. And here's an article, SharePoint DSC is still alive. <laughs> so if, if you have to say something like that, that's not an indication that this is a vibrant, growing, thriving community. So. What I tell my attendees at SANS and my consulting clients is do not invest in DSC. Invest in something like Puppet Chef, Ansible, or Salt instead. And yes, I know that DSC resources can be used by these products uh, like Puppet, and that's nice, but are you really gonna bet your organization's future on that? We'll see. So I recommend investing in something else. DSC, I, I think is probably dead. So PowerShell core on Linux, I think is just a big question mark. Is it attracting developers? 
Is it attracting Linux administrators? So Microsoft is devoted to it. They're putting lots of time and effort, putting out the packages. But who's coming? Just because you build it doesn't mean they will come. And what about PowerShell Core now on Windows? If PowerShell Core on Linux is just a big question mark, what about on Windows? It seems that the odds would be better. And there's good things about PowerShell Core on Windows. For example, PowerShell Core and OpenSSH together is great. It works great. It's fast. I mean, it's, it's really, really nice. Finally, after all these years, we get OpenSSH on Windows. And PowerShell Core is faster. So if that's your number one consideration, you need the code to run faster, well, then switch to PowerShell Core. Now you can use things like for each parallel and the web oriented commandlets were rewritten and they're great. They're more reliable, they're faster, they work, they're great. Microsoft, uh, Mark Krauss, I mean, just did a great job on this. So when will PowerShell Core be installed on Windows by default? That's probably the number one reason that it's being held back on Windows. It's just not installed by default. There's already Windows PowerShell. So somebody asked, congratulations, this is for uh, PowerShell 7. Will PowerShell 7 be installed in the second half of 2020 on Windows 10? And here's the answer from Steve Lee at Microsoft. There is currently no plan to ship PowerShell Core in box. Now, it's not that the PowerShell team doesn't want to do this. They would love to do this, but they don't have control over Microsoft as a whole. Remember, PowerShell Core runs on top of .NET, and that's a whole separate team. And there's all these issues at Microsoft of, for example, supportability, long-term release versus you know, the semi-annual releases. Microsoft instead is focusing on making it as easy as possible to install PowerShell Core on Windows, kind of like, you know, Python. Remember several slides ago, we were talking about that app execution alias for Python, where it pops up a graphical dialog box and prompts you to install Python on your machine. And who knows, maybe next year, Python will be installed by default. Now, related to this is another product, uh, another project called Windows Terminal. And you can run PowerShell inside of Windows Terminal. It's kind of a, a long, verbose tweet here, a set of tweets on the right-hand side, but it's the most concise thing that I could find. And in this case, someone was asking uh, one of the program managers at Microsoft about Windows Terminal and how with Windows Terminal, if a new update is released, Windows Terminal has to be terminated as a process so that it can be patched and updated, and then it can be relaunched again. Now the problem is, what if PowerShell is running inside a Windows terminal? Or what if PowerShell is installed from the Windows store, the Microsoft store, in the exact same way as Windows terminal? And notice down at the bottom, this is actually part of a, a whole conversation, and I couldn't fit it all in the slide. But at the bottom, the program manager at Microsoft or PowerShell says, unfortunately, this is out of the app's control for anything installed from the Microsoft store. Namely, what's out of its control? the fact that that application might be terminated as a part of the patch or update process. So yes, it might be a lot easier to install PowerShell Core on Windows from the Microsoft Store, but then what if you're running like a backup script that takes 12 hours? You get that script running after dinner and then you intend to let it run all night long. But unfortunately, then that's when an update occurs. Now, I haven't been able to reproduce this myself, and, and I'm happy to be wrong about this, but the implication of all this implies that, yes, a running PowerShell core instance, because it's installed from the store, there's a chance that that would be terminated in order to patch or update it. Again, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but that seems to be the implication. And if you're worried about this, then that means definitely you would install from GitHub and in fact, notice that's the recommendation for installing Windows Terminal. If you're worried about Windows Terminal being terminated by Microsoft while it's being updated, well, the recommendation from uh, Kayla Cinnamon is to install Terminal from GitHub, not from the Windows Store. And apparently that applies to PowerShell Core as well. Here's something else. I do lots of training for the DoD, 
lots of people who take my course, or sometimes half of the people in my course are all DOD related people. And for you DOD people out there, you often know that you're working in air gaps. You don't have internet access, you'll never have internet access from that air gap or, or skiff. So with PowerShell core on Windows, not Linux, but only on Windows, when you launch PowerShell core inside the air gap, depending on how DNS is configured, you might have to wait nine seconds. And literally, I have timed this multiple times. You have to wait nine seconds for PowerShell to launch and become available. Now, the reason for it is long and convoluted. But the short of it is, you're waiting for a DNS query to time out. And if your internal DNS servers, if you disable recursion, well, then you immediately send a query and immediately get a response back, right, that uh, for a failed query, and then PowerShell launches like normal. So the delay here is, is not really humanly noticeable. It's only like, you know, like, a, like 100 milliseconds or something. But if you don't have recursion disabled, in other words, if recursion, DNS recursion is enabled inside your air gap, well, then you'll have to wait nine seconds for PowerShell core on Windows to launch. So here's a little posting from GitHub. Here's some cranky person working through all this, trying to figure it out. And again, Microsoft's developers, they're aware of this. They care about it. They want it to be fixed too. And I tried to, to summarize it as quickly, as, as concisely as I could. And I'm speaking as, as though I'm a, a Microsoft manager, so to speak, and my hands are tired and I'm frustrated as a Microsoft manager dealing with this problem. And so kind of speaking as Microsoft, I say, so the AppLocker people don't intend to update AppLocker because even if you don't have any AppLocker rules enabled, this still impacts you. But we're not willing to refactor this part of PowerShell core to be like Windows PowerShell, which doesn't suffer this problem, but we still want you to switch to PowerShell 7 anyway, despite the nine second startup delay in your air gap. If this is not acceptable, the nine second delay, please make a system-wide change to how Windows checks certificate revocation lists, <laughs> not going to happen, or disable recursion on your DNS servers, which might happen, but seriously, for the sake of PowerShell, you're gonna disable recursion on your DNS servers? So down to the bottom, this is a, a response from uh, a, a hardworking person who does care response and says, well, basically your comment adds nothing new. In other words, I take that as kind of like an implicit confirmation that this summary is correct. So PowerShell core on Windows in an air gap, you might literally have to wait nine seconds before you can get to your command prompt. On Linux, there is no delay. And for Windows PowerShell, there is no delay. It's only PowerShell core on Windows. But now we get to the real heart of the matter. On a Windows machine, why would I switch from Windows PowerShell to PowerShell Core? Again, OpenSSH, the performance improvements, those are really nice, don't get me wrong. But in PowerShell Core on Windows, if you run a command that does not exist in PowerShell Core, under the hood, Windows PowerShell is secretly launched in the background. PowerShell Core, talks to the secret background Windows PowerShell, executes the command, the output is relayed back up to PowerShell core and then displayed on your screen. You can read all about it. If you run that command shown at the bottom of the slide, then that's like a little essay that's built into PowerShell and it describes how the Windows PowerShell compatibility module works. But the way it works is like the Wizard of Oz. So pay no attention to that Windows PowerShell remoting session behind the curtain. We want you to use PowerShell core anyway, even though oftentimes when you're executing commands, those commands don't natively exist. They're not natively implemented by PowerShell core. Instead, you are secretly running Windows PowerShell in the background. Well, if that's the case, why would I not just cut out the middleman and just launch Windows PowerShell? So here's another recent uh, tweet. Uh, Ashlyn McGlone is a well-known PowerSheller and he posted a poll. Uh, Are you deploying PowerShell core in the enterprise? Why or why not? And notice that the answers came back 52% no, 
Now, I know that statistically, 276 votes, that's not statistically significant, but there's no other poll that I could find. And remember, who would see this tweet? It's someone who's either following the PowerShell hashtag or they follow Ashley because he's a well-known PowerSheller. So with 256 votes for people who are following the PowerShell hashtag or, or following Ashley, but 52% of them say, no, we are not deploying it. I wouldn't be surprised at all if we were to do a random sampling of all like small, medium and large organizations all around the world. If we could somehow do a random sampling of like 10,000 organizations around the world, how many of them are deploying PowerShell core on Windows or Linux? Is it what, 2%, 1%? I mean, what if I'm off by an order of magnitude? What if it's something like 10%? Again, why would I do it? So now we come back to this diagram again from Redmonk. But it shows that PowerShell is very popular. Really, that's Windows PowerShell. Redmonk doesn't distinguish, as far as I know, between PowerShell Core and Windows PowerShell. But I think the popularity of PowerShell is for Windows PowerShell. So the future of Windows PowerShell on Windows is bright and getting better. Again, I've been doing the PowerShell course at SANS for uh, just over 10 years. Every single year, PowerShell is getting more and more popular. It's being more widely used all around the world. So the future of Windows PowerShell is, is assured. It's, it's very popular. But PowerShell core on Windows? I think it's just a big question mark. It's not that it's bad, it's just that it's not installed by default. And then it has these, well, issues. I think when someday in the future, PowerShell Core is installed by default, well, then things will change and then we can reassess the future. But in the meantime, most people using PowerShell, they're just using Windows PowerShell. The future of PowerShell Core is just a big question mark. All right. Thank you very much for attending this talk. I hope you're having a wonderful time at the conference. If you're interested in taking my PowerShell course at SEC 505 and for the gorilla in the room, right? PowerShell's number one competitor, that's Python. And SANS also has a great Python course, uh, SEC 573. If you'd like to contact me, then here's my Twitter handle, my email address at SANS. And again, if you want this slide deck and the slide decks for my other talks, plus all my scripts that are all in the public domain. And you can get them from blueteampowershell.com. Again, thank you very much for attending this talk. Thank you and have a wonderful conference.